Now, still, however, the problem then to bring this back to the topic really is that we have lumped these diseases together because the most obvious manifestation of type 1 diabetes, which historically was the only one that really ever existed prior until about 100-ish years ago, maybe 150 or so, um, it was the most obvious manifestation or sign and symptom was a consequence of the high glucose, namely the excess urine production, polyuria. In fact, the term diabetes comes from the word of excess, this Greek term for the excessive production of urine or to flow through too quickly. The most obvious sign of diabetes classically was a result of the high glucose and unfortunately that view has persisted where we still look at type 2 diabetes as a disease of too much glucose when if we had a more precise paradigm we would view it as a disorder of too much insulin so in that sense it becomes the exact opposite of type 1 diabetes yes they both share a tendency for hyperglycemia but they get to that end through two totally different means. In the case of type 1 diabetes, it's because of a true deficiency of insulin. In the case of type 2 diabetes, it's because the insulin isn't working very well. In other words, insulin resistance. Now, with all of that as a framework, I don't want you to think that high glucose isn't a problem. Chronic hyperglycemia is pathogenic. It can harm the body. However, so much of what we associate with type 2 diabetes, namely the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, the increased risk of cancer, the increased risk of heart disease and fatty liver disease, those are not problems of the hyperglycemia, but they are problems of the hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin and the associated insulin resistance. So just remember that. Um, the, the final point before going further is that uh, if you have a glucose-centric paradigm, in other words, if your sole focus when you look at the person with diabetes is to lower the glucose at all costs, then you don't care what insulin is doing. And remember, I just got done describing how so much of the pathologies associated with type 2 diabetes in particular are a consequence of the insulin resistance, not the hyperglycemia. So it's the, it's the insulin resistance. So again, if you are trying to lower glucose and to do so you are increasing insulin, and because why not? After all, you have a glucose-centric paradigm. The conventional clinical view would say, that's worth it. It's good. Let's lower glucose at all costs. Then you'd be fine with it. And unfortunately, there are consequences to that perspective that are disastrous. Metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug on the planet for two reasons. One, it's cheap. It's off patent. And two, it works. Despite it being the most commonly used anti-diabetic drug, it's actually, of all the ones we're going to go through today, the least understood. Um, but the main theme of metformin is that it acts by targeting the mitochondria. So that's the main mechanism of action. Now, this is where things do get confusing because some publications will find that it actually acts by improving mitochondrial function. Uh, and, and one of the metrics of doing this in a workhorse tool in my own lab is measuring what's called mitochondrial respiration, or basically how much are the mitochondria breathing? How much are they taking in oxygen? Um, and the purpose of the oxygen is to fuel the flames of metabolism to create energy for the cell in the form of ATP. But the mitochondria are the focus of metformin. But again, the confusion being, is it actually improving mitochondrial function or is it compromising mitochondrial function. I was a co-author on a paper, so I lean this way because we did some of the work, suggesting that metformin actually compromises mitochondria. And by disrupting one of the electron transport complexes, and I'm, I'm getting more specific than I intended, you're actually inhibiting or, or compromising the mitochondria's ability to burn fuel in order to create ATP as the cellular energy. In so, doing the, in so doing, reducing ATP, you end up activating an enzyme called AMPK. And AMPK is an ultimate kind of catabolic master switch. It wants the cell to start burning energy. So if AMPK is activated, glycolysis goes up, so the cell starts using more glucose. And lipolysis and beta oxidation of fats go up, so you start burning more fat for fuel. So metformin ends up having all of these 
generally favorable metabolic outcomes. In fact, metformin, and this is ironic in light of what we're going to get to in just a moment, is sometimes referred to as an exercise mimetic. So it's sometimes described as a drug that can mimic the effects of exercise. This means that metformin will have two general effects that have been pretty well documented. One is that it reduces the liver's production of or, or breakdown of glycogen and, and gluconeogenesis. So in other words, it's stopping or slowing or inhibiting the liver's production or output of glucose which is a good thing. That's going to reduce blood glucose levels, which helps insulin come down. And then speaking of insulin, there's evidence to suggest that muscle, which by mass is the main insulin sensitive, insulin dependent tissue in the body, the muscle becomes more insulin sensitive directly. Let's talk about the consequences. So one of the most obvious consequences to someone on metformin is the, is the bubbling in the tummy, if you will, the nausea and the GI distress, some nausea and diarrhea. Um, that's the generally main symptom. But then the mitochondria-specific effects are relevant. There are multiple papers to show that, especially as we age, if people are on metformin, metformin is directly blunting the body's favorable adaptation to exercise, whether it is aerobic or resistance. So there are studies in humans to show that metformin blunts the mitochondrial adaptations to endurance exercise. So if someone is running or engaging in any kind of aerobic activity, normally you would expect their mitochondria to get better and stronger because of that activity. Metformin stops that. It blunts that from happening. Additionally, there's evidence in older humans to find that uh, metformin blunts the muscle adaptation, the muscle protein synthesis, the growing and strengthening of muscle tissue in response to in, uh, resistance exercise. Uh, so uh, I find it particularly amusing that these longevity gurus, and I do mean to kind of have that dripping with sarcasm and a little disrespect, um, that a lot of these people who have become experts, if you will, in longevity, an area in which you cannot be an expert because there's no human um, trials to support that. Um, they, In one breath, they'll be advocating metformin, and then in the other, they're advocating exercise. Those two don't go together nicely.